All right, responding to Kurzgesagt. I'll try to be Kurzgesagt myself for once. He was not Kurzgesagt for once. Regarding the state of the climate crisis, it's bad, really bad, and it will get better. But it's not too late to prevent the baddest from happening. And I don't even think it's too late to create a decent future. More than ever, we need action not people giving up. So I see value in countering climate doomerism, the belief that it's too late to do anything about the climate crisis. The Kurzgesagt video, We Will Fix Climate Change, attempts just that by presenting good news and positive trends about the state of action on the climate crisis. And it argues that things aren't as hopeless as many think. But though I hate to kill the good vibes, I do have criticisms about the best news of the video that emissions are no longer necessarily coupled to economic growth. To be brief and blunt, I think Kurzgesagt is overstating their case, overly committed to a clean growth narrative, and too reliant on the idea of decoupling, which a lot of research concludes isn't possible at the scale and speed we need. By the way, if you've already seen Bad Empanada's video response and are wondering if you should bother with this one, I will cover different ground than that video, so please keep watching. This part of the Kurzgesagt video concerns what is arguably the most important discussion almost no one is having, that of the ecological feasibility of eternal economic growth. Economic growth, as measured in GDP, that is, gross domestic product, the sum total of all monetary activity in a country over a given time, usually a year, is the near-universal goal of all societies around the world, to such an extent that GDP growth is often thought of as the standard metric for progress, TM, itself. Not only is GDP growth considered good, and by some economists even a moral imperative, growth is necessary for the economy to even function. To the extent it does. Investors want returns, and banks want interest. If the economy doesn't grow, that doesn't happen. Except for government bailouts, perhaps. And so we get a recession, when everybody loses their jobs, homes, life savings, dignity, and sense of security through no fault of their own. So the current socio-economic system Capitalism. is structurally dependent on growth. It's grow or die. That's as true for individual companies as it is for the economy as a whole. However, the downside of economic growth is that it requires energy and natural resources and thus necessarily has environmental impacts, which get worse the more and faster the economy grows. GDP growth is correlated or coupled, mind you, it's not a cute couple, with deforestation, animal extinction, pollution, overfishing, and, most relevant for this in Kurzgesagt's video, carbon emissions. So is it grow or die, or grow and die? There's a serious contradiction here. On the one hand, economic growth is good and necessary. On the other, economic growth is destroying the planet, which is also good and necessary. Or at least, personally, I think the planet is good and necessary. I don't know if that's a controversial take or not, but I stand by it. The planet is good and necessary. I rely on the planet like every single day for literally everything. But maybe I just have a problematic dependence on the planet that I should seek help for. Let me know in the comments if you think I'm a planet junkie. Or if you or a loved one are. But seriously though, how do we solve the contradiction between economy and ecology? The most commonly proposed solution is green growth. The idea that through new technology, better energy and resource efficiency, dematerialization, switching from an industrial to a service-based economy, and just generally harnessing the wonders of innovation and the free market, we can continue to grow the economy while reducing the environmental impacts from growth. Counterintuitively, and conveniently for the powers that be, the solution to the problems created by economic growth is more economic growth. Just green this time. Kurzgesagt's video overall fits in with such a green growth narrative, with the solutions being mostly of a technological and or market-oriented kind, like investing in artificial meats or carbon capture so they get cheaper and so more people will use them. Sounds like supply and demand to me. 
The video also cites examples of countries that have lowered their CO2 emissions while growing their GDP, which sounds like proof of green growth and decoupling in action. A crucial idea for green growth to work is precisely decoupling, that is, breaking up the toxic couple of GDP growth and a given environmental impact, in this case carbon emissions. There are two kinds of decoupling, relative and absolute. Relative decoupling means that GDP goes up, while a given environmental impact still goes up, but slower than it otherwise would have. Absolute decoupling means that GDP goes up, while the environmental impact goes down. And it's this kind of decoupling we need if green growth is to be a viable solution. To illustrate with an example, say that a country gets all of its energy from coal, 100%, and so has high carbon emissions. Then say that the country switches from coal to natural gas. Because gas has a lower carbon footprint than coal, during that switch we would see an absolute decoupling, because carbon emissions would go down while GDP would go up. But if we're serious about meeting the targets of the Paris Agreement, which anyone with a shred of concern for life on Earth should consider non-negotiable, decoupling can't just be absolute, it also needs to be permanent rather than temporary. Because say that GDP keeps rising and energy demand and thus natural gas consumption rises with it, eventually the carbon emissions would catch up to where they were before the switch from coal, but they would rise more slowly than if the switch had never happened. This is relative decoupling. Absolute decoupling tends to be short term and turn into relative decoupling, or even into recoupling. The US is a great case in point here. Kurzgesagt cites as an example of a country that has decoupled GDP from CO2. And the US has indeed lowered its emissions thanks to a 2300 terawatt hour drop in energy from coal between 2009 and 2019. However, in the same time span, natural gas production expanded by the same amount, and production of oil also expanded by 500 terawatt hours. Yes, carbon emissions dropped in the US, but it's far from given they'll keep going down. Once there's no more coal to replace with gas, carbon emissions can only go one way. The title of that Pixar movie with the sad scene at the beginning. But not as sad as what's happening to the planet. Let that sink in. Think about how sad you were while watching that scene. The eco-crisis is sadder than that. Now, you might be going, well, duh. Of course decoupling will only be temporary if you switch from one fossil fuel to another. That's why we need renewable energy. I fully agree that we need an energy system run on 100% renewables, and we need it fast. But I am skeptical that the switch can happen fast enough for us to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement with green growth. Look at the US again. The capacity of solar and wind expanded by a combined 1000 terawatt hours between 2009 and 19 which is nice, but overall energy consumption grew by 1,300 terawatt hours. Renewables didn't even cover new energy demand in the US. It's a similar story worldwide. Energy consumption grew by almost 30,000 terawatt hours between 2009 and 2019, while renewables of all kinds grew by only around 7,000 terawatt hours. The sad truth is that renewables have so far not replaced a single kilowatt hour of fossil energy. At most, you could argue that the renewables prevented some fossil energy from being used, but that's not good enough. Still, Kurzgesagt make the point that GDP and CO2 are still decoupling in their example countries even when you take imported goods into account. So what's up with that? My guess is that this has much to do with China and the US, the two biggest manufacturing countries in the world, moving away from coal and towards oil and gas. That at least explains why CO2 emissions leveled off in 2015 and 16 before rising again. But not before green growth enthusiasts got hyped up about the possibility that we were about to see peak carbon and global decoupling. Sure, some individual countries have replaced much of their fossil fuels with renewables. And granted, the development and rollout of solar and wind has exceeded all expectations. And I'm certain they'll expand even more in the near future. That's worth celebrating. But the question is, will this switch happen fast enough to limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade? And more importantly for the prospects of green growth, 
Will this happen while still growing the world's GDP? You might say, We just haven't tried hard enough because of vested interest and corrupt politicians. Indeed, Kurzgesagt said something to that effect in their sources. Many experts argue that decoupling is currently only possible with great effort. So what if we tried our absolute possible best? Even then it doesn't look good. Jason Hickel and Georges Kallis cite some numbers in their paper, Is Green Growth Possible? Assuming 3% GDP growth a year, starting in 2020. Okay, so I'm not smart enough to update the math here, so just pretend we're back in 2020. I know, I know, it's dramatic. Calm down. Breathe. It's okay. It's only pretend. It's really 2022. The pandemic is not over. Anywho, starting in 2020, decoupling needs to happen at 10.5% a year to make the 1.5 degree target or 7.3% a year for the 2 degree target. Again, assuming 3% GDP growth a year, which is considered a good growth rate. If we assume 2.1% GDP growth a year, which is more in line with the actual growth rates in the recent decades, decoupling needs to be at 9.6% for 1.5 degrees and 6.4% for 2 degrees. However, Empirical models suggest that we cannot decouple at more than 3-4% to a year. So even if we try our very best, making the targets in the Paris Agreement might not be possible if we insist on growing GDP. And this only concerns decoupling GDP from CO2. Renewable tech like solar panels, wind turbines and batteries require a lot of minerals. And it's not a given that we have enough of them to switch all our current energy consumption to renewables. Much less that we can then keep growing. And that's not to mention the environmental and social impacts of the mining, which would have to expand greatly for renewables to cover the energy consumption of the whole world. Mining for minerals for renewable tech might have to expand to the ocean floor with deep seabed mining, which has unknown but probably terrible consequences for marine life. And they already have all our plastics to contend with. <coughs> And of course, mining and extraction for resources has always hurt marginalized human communities the most, especially in the global south, resulting in land grabbing and pollution. And there's no reason to think it'll be different with minerals for renewable tech. Lithium mining in Chile is already hurting local indigenous communities. And of course, the owner of Twitter and Tesla once made noises about we will coo whoever we want, deal with it, in reference to Bolivia and their juicy lithium reserves. Even if we could decouple GDP growth from carbon emissions in time, it's not good enough to switch out one bad environmental outcome for another, because carbon emissions make up only one part of a bigger eco-crisis. And it's also not acceptable to decouple at the expense of the world's marginalized. What kind of energy we use isn't the only aspect to decoupling. There's also, as I mentioned, gains in energy and resource efficiency, dematerialization, and switching to services rather than production. But there are logical problems with all of them because the economy has to grow forever. And so if decoupling is to be sustained, technology needs to become more efficient forever. Dematerialization needs to go on forever. And services, which also has a material footprint, needs to become more energy and resource efficient forever. Saying forever so many times in a row makes this sound absurd, but that is what the logic of green growth requires. And I haven't even mentioned rebound effects yet, i.e. when efficiency gains are used to fuel even more growth, so that savings eventually lead to greater overall use. Because if something gets more energy and resource efficient, it also gets cheaper, all else being equal. So why not use more of it? or use the money you save on other polluting activities. How do you prevent the winning from going up and the spinning? Kultzkezak themselves actually bring up this exact point and the limits to technological efficiency in their video on climate doom. Curious that they missed that in this video since rebound effects are very relevant when talking about the feasibility of decoupling. Mind you, I'm not saying no to renewables or more efficient technology. I'm skeptical of the merits of a service-based economy. I think the economy should be centered around care work, but that's not important now. 
The point I'm making is that in an economy predicated on eternal growth, it's silly to think that we can run away from our ecological problems by making everything more and more efficient forever. Green growth advocates need to perform some astounding mental gymnastics to get around the commonsensical idea that you cannot have eternal economic growth on a planet with finite resources. Now, it's worth pointing out that in Kulskazak's video, their excitement for decoupling is qualified. Emissions are no longer necessarily coupled to economic growth. And like I already mentioned, in their sources, Kulskazak state that many experts argue that decoupling is currently only possible with great effort. I'd put that more strongly. Many experts argue that it's not possible at all. The consensus on decoupling is that it's not happening at the scale and speed necessary to meet even the more lenient targets of the Paris Agreement. And it's unlikely it will. If you don't take my word for it, well done you critical thinker you, not taking some random internet weirdo at their word, I can point you to no less than three meta-studies on this issue, including the one that Kutzkesakt cites in their sources. These are all open access and I highly recommend you read them. After you finish this video, of course. Links in the doobly-doo. Here are some highlights though. First from the already mentioned Is Green Growth Possible by Hickel and Collis. Empirical evidence on resource use in carbon emissions does not support green growth theory. Green growth is likely to be a misguided objective. And here from the aptly titled report Decoupling Debunked from the European Environmental Bureau, the conclusion is both overwhelmingly clear and sobering. Not only is there no empirical evidence supporting the existence of a decoupling of economic growth from environmental pressures on anywhere near the scale needed to deal with the environmental breakdown, but also, and perhaps more importantly, such decoupling appears unlikely to happen in the future. And finally, from the study cited by Kotzgesagt, bearing the catchy title, a systematic review of the evidence on decoupling of GDP, resource use, and greenhouse gas emissions, part two, a rare case of the sequel being better than the original, synthesizing the insights by Haberl et al. We conclude that large rapid absolute reductions of resource use and greenhouse gas emissions cannot be achieved through absurd decoupling rates. Hence, decoupling needs to be complemented by sufficiency-oriented strategies and strict enforcement of absolute reduction targets. So, green growth is wishful thinking at best, and a dangerous gamble with the future at worst. Change my mind. Also, Kutzkesakt misrepresents scientific consensus on decoupling. Change my mind. In fairness, it happens to the best. Even the recent IPCC Working Group 3 report don't play straight with the science of decoupling, saying that decoupling is feasible Yet, the sources they cite don't support that claim. It's something of a scandal, if you ask me. But it goes to show how hegemonic the idea of growth is. Even in the face of so much evidence that growth, even of a green kind, spells worsening ecological disaster, few are willing to give it up. Now, that's an inconvenient truth. Kultzkazakt's goal with their video was to prevent climate doomerism, which I think is admirable enough. It doesn't excuse what I consider to be a bending of the truth, but with that said, I'd hate to contribute to doomerism myself. And if I ended the video now, I'd end it on a note of despair, and I mean, what is this, planet of the humans? Still, the points I'm making are climate black pill material, especially if we assume that GDP growth is equivalent to progress TM itself, the only road to happiness and prosperity, or at the very least, just a brute fact of economic life that you have to accept. There is no alternative. But what if those assumptions weren't true? Throughout this video, I've made an ecological critique of economic growth, an argument that is rather obvious and old. The Limits to Growth report is 50 years old this year, after all. Incidentally, its worst-case scenario predictions have been validated by modern research, which means we might be on track for societal collapse by mid-century. Whoops! To me, the ecological argument alone debunks the idea of GDP equals progress TM. Over half of all wildlife has disappeared since the 1970s, a million species are facing extinction, a fifth of the Amazon rainforest is gone, 
by 2050 we'll probably have more plastic than fish in the ocean. Insect populations, including pollinators around the world, are in decline. They're already pollinating crops by hand in parts of China. We're looking at a future with more hunger, several hundred million, if not over a billion, climate refugees, more extreme weather events, and there's a 50-50 chance the world will temporarily hit 1.5 degrees within the next five years. Is this progress? Care to comment, Steven Pinker? But the ecological critique of economic growth isn't the only one around. There's a social critique as well, arguing that GDP growth isn't just bad for the planet, it's not really good for people either. Because GDP is a flawed measure of a country's economic and social well-being, because it only counts monetary activity. So things happening outside the market isn't included. And since both good and bad things cost money, GDP counts both good and bad outcomes as growth. A million dollars worth of wheat counts as much as a million dollars worth of poop emoji floats. GDP goes up when people spend money on antidepressants, or on gas for a car that will be stuck in traffic, or on unsustainably grown food at the supermarket, or on cleaning up an oil spill, or on weapons for a war. On the other hand, GDP does not go up if people don't buy antidepressants, or if they bike to work, or grow their own food, or if natural environments are left unharmed. If we achieved world peace and all the weapons manufacturers went bankrupt, that would probably count as a negative in terms of GDP. And it would cause the stupidest recession ever. Note, I don't intend to denigrate people who suffer from depression and get relief from medication. Taking antidepressants is a legitimate way to deal with depression. It's just a bit messed up how someone buying antidepressants in itself counts as a positive in the economy. So the relationship between GDP per capita and well-being is tenuous at best. How high a country's GDP is tells us little about stuff like inequality, life expectancy, health, civil rights, political corruption, and the like. And past a certain point, more GDP growth doesn't improve people's lives. But do you know what would improve people's lives? The planet not being on fire. Insert pawn shop meme going, sorry, the best we can do is carbon trading. Let's focus a bit on inequality, because GDP growth is a common defense of inequality. Sure, some people might have obscene amounts of wealth, and you poor naive soul might think that the best course of action is to redistribute that wealth to the needy. But if rich people can just keep their money, they'll invest it, and the economy will grow. If we just grow the pie, there's no need to redistribute wealth, because a rising tide lifts all boats. Everyone wins. It should come as no surprise that trickle-down economics has been debunked. Growing the pie doesn't solve inequality or make it more bearable because most of the growth is captured by the rich. Inequality has only gotten worse over the past four decades. So why even grow the pie? Because come on rich people, you got a lot of pie already. You can't possibly eat that much pie. Yet, you force us to make more pie so we can get a tiny extra sliver of it, if we're lucky, but more likely we'll just get the promise of pie. Seriously, you got so much pie. Hand over the pie, asshole. Growth cannot bring an end to inequality because inequality itself fuels growth. To grow the economy, you don't just need energy and resources, you also need labor. Cheap labor. And there's no more tried and true way of forcing people to work jobs they hate for low wages than the credible threat of starvation and homelessness. That's literally a centuries-old strategy. We've seen it with enclosure, colonialism, odious debt, privatization. In short, robbing people of the commons and forcing them into wage labor and market economy. Some have characterized the economy's relationship to growth as an addiction, implying that people just can't help themselves, growth is just so good. But saying the economy is addicted to growth is like saying a fish is addicted to water, or that a human is addicted to a healthy biosphere. 
says the planet junkie. The economy as it currently functions has to grow. There is a growth imperative. We have no choice. We are forced by the structure of the economy to make it grow. Doesn't that strike you as tyrannical? As totalitarian? To me, it's a clear example of how humanity is serving the economy rather than the other way around. We aren't the masters of the economy. It is the master of us. Regardless of how much of a growth enthusiast you are, even if you've disagreed with everything else I've said in this video, and if that's the case, I sincerely thank you for sticking around this long. Wouldn't you agree that it would be better if we could choose growth rather than be forced into growth? Wouldn't that be a better system, one with more choice? Isn't freedom to choose supposed to be one of the virtues of this system? You know, to choose the color of one's tie and all? Yet, in one crucial way, we don't have a choice. And because of that lack of choice, we are making it exponentially more difficult to solve the biggest threat to life on Earth since the meteor that killed the goddamn dinosaurs. Kurzgesagt says in their video that we need to fundamentally change our industrial system. Which sounds radical, but it's not radical enough. This demand fits in with a flawed idea of green growth present in the rest of the video. No, we need to go deeper and fundamentally change how the socioeconomic system itself works, because green growth won't save us. So what if we changed a thing or two? What if we made the system not dependent on growth? What if we decided to fulfill the needs of humans, animals and nature rather than the market? What if we had democratic control over the economy, the means to decide which sectors of it to grow and which to downsize or even eliminate? This brings me to the alternative, degrowth. No, not degrowth, de growth, with me. Degrowth is a movement and school of thought that aims at bringing about a planned reduction in material and energy use to solve the eco-crisis in a globally just and equitable way that improves people's quality of life. Well, most people. The billionaires might get pissed at the maximum wage and wealth policies, but who cares about them? They hoard pie. The goal of degrowth is to transition the world to a socioeconomic system that isn't structurally dependent on growth and which provides a decent standard of living to all without wrecking the planet. A system centered around commons, care work, sharing economies, and democratic control. Degrowth policy proposals include reducing the work week, universal basic income, job guarantee programs, banning planned obsolescence, regulating or banning advertising, eliminating artificial scarcities of all kinds, and expanding public services. To summarize in a slogan, degrowth is about private sufficiency and public luxury. Degrowth is still a marginal perspective, but it has caught on in a big way in recent years. It's even discussed in a recent working group 2 and 3 reports from the IPCC, along with the flawed discussion of decoupling. But you know, that redeems it in my eyes. In the full reports, mind you. I guess was too spicy for the technical and policymaker summaries. Kurzgesagt themselves actually mentioned degrowth in a previous video, only to dismiss it. But all the sensible solutions they bring up at the end of the We Will Fix Climate Change video, like using less energy and resources and making products more durable and repairable, would be easier to achieve if we liberated ourselves from the growth imperative. You might say, This is impossible to achieve! It'll be difficult, certainly, because degrowth goes against the interests of the powerful. But you know what's really impossible? Green growth. You might say, This is different, that's scary! Big social changes can be scary. But you know what's even scarier? The planet burning to a crisp and billions of people dying in the process. And working minimum wage all the while, just to add insult to injury. You might still be committed to the growth equals prosperity mindset and say, It'll ruin people's quality of life. Well, isn't it already ruined? Isn't life under this exploitative, destructive, restrictive system already terrible? 
If you aren't so unlucky or stuck in a toxic mine in the Congo digging for cobalt, or in an apple factory in China with suicide prevention on nets under the windows, or in the fire hazard of a sweatshop in Bangladesh sewing clothes for H&M, if you're lucky enough to be born in the Imperial core, you're still probably overworked in the precarious gig economy. You struggle to pay bills and make rent, you're in debt, you work a job you hate, and the pandemic demonstrated unambiguously that the people on top consider you utterly disposable. And even if all of that's not a problem, even if you're quite privileged, you might have the realization that all those new shiny things you keep buying aren't making you happy. It's not filling that void in your soul. It doesn't help against your loneliness and depression. Maybe it's just making you feel guilty over the exploitation you know you're partaking in through your consumption. Or maybe you have that deep sense of dread over the future, over how your old age will look like, and over how your children's lives will be. Or perhaps you think that you maybe shouldn't even have children because of how terrible the future is looking. Because although you try not to think about it, the knowledge of the awful state of the planet is always there, like a background noise you try to tune out, but you can never quite forget about it, no matter how much pie you hoard. Notes. The monologue could imply that only privileged and rich people care about the climate crisis, which is obviously not true. Surveys in the US show that low-income and non-white populations care the most about the environment, and global surveys reveal that countries in the global south are most concerned about the climate crisis, which makes total sense as they're the most affected by it. But the fact that there's a market for luxury doomsday bunkers clearly show that even rich <coughs> people suffer a certain kind of eco-anxiety, even if they respond to it in the most rich person way possible. I'd argue life is shitty for pretty much everyone, no matter your class. There are different levels of shittiness to be sure. Some are only up to their knees in shit, others have it up to their necks. But we're all standing in shit. The people defending the system, saying it's the best one possible and everything's better now than it's ever been. Just look at the graphs, we can't stop now. Well, they've just gotten used to ignoring the smell. Degrowth, with its strong emphasis on extending the commons and strengthening community, on ensuring that everyone has enough, holds the promise of a better life for the vast majority of people. I agree with Kutzkesak that it is possible to increase prosperity without increasing emissions. But we mean different things by it. I'll admit degrowth is utopian, but the world needs utopian thinking right now. Positive visions for the future are good antidotes to doomerism. And to me, degrowth is incredibly inspiring. Delving into this stuff has made me hopeful and helped me deal with my eco-anxiety. I named my IB Award nominated video about Jason Hickel's book on degrowth. This book cured my eco-anxiety. That title is an exaggeration, but not that much of an exaggeration. I'm more optimistic now than I was a few years ago because there's something powerful about knowing there is a way to solve this crisis, a way that could make the world a better place even. I think utopia is still possible for us, even on this damaged planet. Kutzgesagt and green growth doesn't make me feel hopeful, but degrowth does. Thank you for watching. That turned out longer than I expected. That was not Kutzgesagt at all. It happens every time, that's why it takes me so long to make these videos. Anyway, to learn more about degrowth, check out my video about it. And also check out Our Changing Climate's video on degrowth. I also highly recommend Jason Hickel's book, as well as the more recent book, The Future is Degrowth. A guide to a world beyond capitalism. 
by Matthias Schmelzer, Andrea Wetter, and Aaron Van Sintian. I hope I pronounced those names sort of correctly. This last book is more comprehensive than Hickel's. It provides a good overview of the development and different strands of degrowth, the different lines of growth critique, the debates within the degrowth movement, as well as responses to typical critiques. Incidentally, here's a response to a common objection. Degrowth advocates aren't opposed to growth of all kinds at all times. Degrowth for the sake of degrowth is as stupid as growth for the sake of growth. We need growth in renewable energy. We need growth in public transport and high-speed rail. We need growth in repair shops and easily repairable goods. We need growth in regenerative agriculture. We need growth in plant and lab-based alternatives to meat, egg, and dairy. We need growth in industrial hemp. We need growth in research into mushroom technology. We need growth in YouTube channels providing critiques of the growth economy, like, comment, and subscribe. The point is that growth should be a choice, something open to democratic deliberation and considered in light of ecological realities, which is why I think degrowth complements eco-socialism. Have a great day, everyone.